more importantly, um, quite a while ago. Uh, in fact, one of the very first things I did when I became the almost but not quite interim director of PVR, um, there was a little bit of overlap between Bill and I. One of the things that happened was the legislature summoned a whole bunch of people to discuss exempt properties. And it was a really hot topic in 2013, which was the year that I started at PVR. And the reason was, of course, I don't know if this will come as a surprise to anyone, but the legislature felt they were short of money for the education fund. And someone had gotten into their head that they ought to look into all the properties that were claimed to be exempt around the state. Good idea, worthy of a topic for the legislature to address. And um, even though that was in the age of spreadsheets and sometimes presentations and that sort of thing, what actually showed up in the legislature was a printout. It was about three and a half inches thick, um, listing every single property in the state of Vermont that was deemed exempt. And like all good legislators, the first thing that they did was go to their town and look at all of the properties that were claimed to be exempt in their town. And many of them were surprised to see the kinds of properties that were exempt from property taxes. So as a result, they insisted on an annual detailed report on exempt properties. And more importantly, what they wanted to know was what is the value of all of these exempt properties? And that's why, as a result of uh, the adoption of 3802A, Title 32, VSA 3802A, you now have the privilege of trying to figure out assessed values or insurance values for properties that are actually exempt and don't get taxed because the legislature wants to know the trend on exemptions. So um, for those of you who don't know, PVR puts out an annual report. It includes information on every topic related to assessment. Um, obviously, its primary purpose is to talk about the um, equalized value of school tax purposes, but there are reports in there about current use. And if you dig a little bit deep, into some of the supplemental information, you can find out about the exempt properties in Vermont. I didn't produce a list, but you can go and check and see what other towns around you have for exempt properties. But I did grab these statistics, which are the totals. So last year, there were 11,017 exempt properties. This year, which would technically be the year, the 2023-2024 the, the data because the report is published in January, there were 11,034 exempt properties, so it increased by 17. That's not too bad. Um, of those 11,034 properties as listers, you collectively created an assessed value for 9,950 of them. That's very good. For those that you didn't do assessed values on, they used the uh, insurable replacement value for 939 properties. And um, I'm assuming that uh, UNDET val is undetermined values. So out of 11,034, only 145 properties don't have their value associated with them. But I found it fascinating that of the properties that are exempt, the value as determined by you folks is just a little over $10 billion. And that's against a listed value on the, your combined grand lists of $94 billion. 
that means that 10% of the value of the total grand list is actually exempt from taxes, which I find somewhat interesting. More interesting is the fact that the 10% of value is spread across a minute percentage of the total number of properties in Vermont. So we'll probably get this number not quite right, but my recollection is there are about 337,000 parcels um, in the current accumulated grand lists, of which 11,000 are exempt, but they represent 10% of the value. Now, I understand that Chittenden County is a huge problem there because um, just in the Burlington area, we have UVM, Champlain College, and St. Michael's College, which collectively probably represent a not inconsiderable portion of that um, total exemption. Uh, add in all the hospitals, that number gets pretty big. And then everything else that has some level of exemption. So it's important to keep track of that. It's important to be aware of the consequences when someone asks you to determine that their property should be exempt from taxes. There are obviously properties that really ought to be exempt for the purposes that they serve, but keep in mind that there's a lot of exempt value out there. All right, so if you want to dive deeper into property tax exemptions, then you're going to go to Title 32 and look at Chapter 125. And that starts off with Section 3800. And at least as to part of that, hang on a minute, the air guard is flying a Blackhawk over my house. There we go. Um, in that 2013 legislation that they uh, that they adopted, one of the things that they did was express the purpose for why the exemption statutes exist. And we all had a pretty good idea of why um, properties would be exempt from taxation, but the legislature decided that they were going to specify, among other things, that specifically um, in 3802.4, the purpose of the exemption is to allow those organizations that fit into that, those categories, they're in 38024, to dedicate more of their resources to furthering their public service missions. And that makes perfect sense. So the key words that we'll deal with today um, in 38024 are public, pious, and charitable. I think those are fairly easy words. You can look every one of them up in the dictionary and they have a specific meaning. And then it comes down to you folks when you're presented with the question, is this property exempt for typically public or charitable uses? Although there are some questions around pious uses also. And so in a minute, you're going to see there's not a lot of guidance in that statute. Fortunately, there is more information in 32 VSA 3832, which talks about the limitations on exemptions. And we're going to look at both of those statutes in some detail. And here's the first one, 32 VSA 38024 which is broken down into a series of subtopics. A practice of the legislature to mush things together. I, if someone had asked me, which they did not, I would have done this as a list, not mushed together in a paragraph. And I might have combined some of the elements of 38 32 and this together. So you don't have to go looking in multiple places to figure out what the rules are. But that said, this is how it's done. And so the first category of exempt property are the real and personal property granted, sequestered, or used for public, pious, or charitable uses. 
way. Interestingly, there's a subset. You, you would think that Caius would cover churches, I would at least, but there is a completely separate subset for that identifies real property owned by churches or church societies or conferences. And remember that that requires both. It has to be owned by the church, the church society or the conference, and it has to be used as a parsonage and personal property therein used by ministers engaged in the full time work in the care of the churches, their fellowship within the state. And that's a lot of words. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, I had a great question asked by one of the listers who was attending this program. And the listers question was this. There is a church in our town that has a parsonage associated with it. No minister. They rent the property to a family at below market rates to maintain the church's mission of, of, of helping people. And they want that to be exempt as a parsonage. Well, parsonage technically isn't used for pious purposes. It is owned by a church. So we fit the first part. But my suggestion was to look carefully at the second part of the statute here and used as a parsonage. By a minister engaged in full time work in the care of the churches. It didn't really work. Um, there might have been other reasons that they might have looked into making it exempt. But specifically under 32 VSA 38024, it doesn't really work. Um, more interesting, what happens if the parsonage is in fact occupied by a minister who doesn't work full time for the church? Again, it doesn't meet all the words in the statute. And remember yesterday when we talked about how one reads a statute, not only do you give the words their ordinary meaning, you do have to try to avoid um, absurd results, but you have to give effect to every part of the statute. So you can't stop reading after you get to the words real property owned by church or church society and used as a parsonage because it goes on to say, also used by ministers engaged in full-time work um, in, uh, for their uh, fellowship. Hmm. So uh, I don't know what the town ultimately did, but um, I did my part of pointing out what the words in the statute meant, and whatever they chose to do, I'm sure it was the right thing. So let's take a look at the third category of exempt properties under the subpart four, and that's the real and personal estate set apart for library uses and used by the public and private circulating libraries, open to the public and not used for profit. Oh, one's not too hard. Fourth category, lands leased by towns um, or school districts for educational purposes and lands owned or leased by colleges, academies, or other public schools or leased by towns for the support of the gospel. Um, the leased by towns for the support of the gospel probably comes from a very long time ago. Uh, and some of those uh, elements, particularly lands owned and leased by colleges, academies, and other public schools, have been something of a hotbed of litigation um, in the tax assessment world. Yes, I realize those are a peculiar set of words to put together, but um, in the context of the disputes that arise in assessing, um, you'd be surprised at the number that, that involves schools and colleges because sometimes the schools are, I'm going to say a little bit loosely defined, they are often nonprofit organizations created to address a specific issue or a specific group of people who maybe are not well served or maybe not served at all, but probably at the very least not well served by um, the general public schools. 
And so some of the special programs for people with visual impairments or hearing impairments and other issues of those kinds often show up in a request for tax exemption. And there are some things that you can look at um, in the process of analyzing that to determine whether or not an exemption is appropriate. Now, I didn't highlight the fifth category because it really doesn't apply anymore. But given my interest in the history of Vermont and the stories that I heard from my father who practiced law in Vermont uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s. This, sec this final category here is kind of interesting. The lands and buildings owned and used by towns for the support of the poor therein. Well, for those of you who either have not been long term Vermont residents or not long enough Vermont residents, maybe because you haven't been alive long enough. Um, not that long ago. OK, so it's pushing 75 years now. Each town was responsible for the destitute in their town. There was no state agency that dealt with human services. There were no food stamps. There were no SNAP programs. There was no Medicaid. There were literally no state programs to take care of people who had fallen on unfortunate circumstances. And it fell to each town to do so. So if you're wondering why there is a road, street, mm, class four road, terminated road in your town that is referred to as poor farm road, well, the reason is because in fact, there was a farm on that property that was used to raise food to help feed people who didn't have enough food. And um, as as bad as it sounds, according to my father, who wasn't uh, I'm old, but I wasn't alive long enough to actually know this was going on. One of the classic events around the time, and I don't remember what date it was, when the town had to take the census of the poor people, um, the unfortunate people in its care. There was allegedly because I can't prove it, a well-known movement to sort of shuffle people who might otherwise show up on your census into another town just before the count was made so that some other town would have to assume their responsibility, would assume responsibility for those folks that, that the town uh, officials managed to shuffle into another town. I have no idea if that's true or not. But I certainly heard that story several times and actually from a couple different people. All right, so what is interesting is there are there are specific statutes that talk about limitations on exemptions, but it was ne found necessary to drop a limitation on exempt properties into this specific section and notice that it applies to lands owned or leased by colleges, academies, and other public schools are not exempt if the buildings are rented for general commercial purposes, nor to farming or timberlands owned or leased. But um, then they said, because they said school, school lands that are leased, they had to be careful to go back and subtract from the things that are not exempt. So we got a double negative there, making them continu continuously exempt. The, the so-called college lease lands. All right, so there are 17 other sections in 3802 that we're not really going to talk about in any detail right now. Uh, but if you have a question that comes up before about whether a property is exempt or not, be sure you pay attention not just to the sort of broad category that's listed, but match up the broad category with any limitations on the exemptions and do what I did with the parsonage. Be sure you understand all of the text that applies in a specific case. That's why I think this section is poorly drafted. 
yeah, the semicolons are in there, but making this a list would have made it a whole lot more uh, intelligible if you ask me. All right, so I mentioned that 32 VSA 3832 uh, identifies limitations on the potential exemption of property for public pious and charitable uses. This is one of those statutes that you want to read very carefully because while it was drafted and it is grammatically correct, it is grammatically challenging if you ask me. So the opening sentence or the opening clause of the paragraph um, of 3832 says the exemption from taxation of real and personal estate granted sequestered or used for public pious or charitable uses. And here's the key word, shall not be construed as exempting. OK, so we're not going to exempt. And subparagraph two. Real estate owned or kept by a religious society. The limitation on the exclusion from the exemption this is why I think this is a terrible way to do this. Other than a church edifice, a parsonage, the outbuildings of the church edifice or parsonage, a building used as a convent, school, orphanage, home or hospital, together with the land adjacent to any of the buildings named in this subdivision, it may be used as a parking lot, provided it's not used to produce income. Now, notice how poorly constructed that particular sentence is because we assume that not used to produce income only applies to parking lot. But the uh, punctuation doesn't really work there. We assume that lawns, playgrounds, and gardens are meant to be modified by that other than resulting in lawns, playgrounds, and gardens being qualified as potentially exempt property as long as it's owned or kept by a religious society. Um, but again, not a model of great clear drafting, grammatically correct, but not a model of great clarity, particularly for people who have not had the advantage of dealing with the way statutes are written in the regular course of maybe their employment or their life. Um, another one of my particularly favorite sections, mostly because I had to have people explain this to me several times because I just didn't get this when I was at PBR. So the exemption from taxation of real and personal estate granted sequester use for public pious or charitable uses shall not be construed as exempting real and personal property of an organization when the property is used primarily for health or recreational purposes unless oops okay so some of these properties are in fact exempt one the town or municipality in which the property is located so votes at any regular or special meeting duly warned therefore so a uh, meeting has to approve this then we get the and except for the following types of property. So following the flow, I went to Catholic school, so sentence diagramming is embedded in my very psyche. The exemption doesn't apply to real and personal property when used primarily for health or recreational purposes, unless one, you vote for it. Now, we've got an and except. What I believe they mean is, you don't have to vote for this, but could be wrong, and except for the following types of property, which includes, and this was the one that got me, real and personal property operated as a skating rink. Why? Because several of the skating rinks around the state are not actually owned by a municipality or operated by a municipality. They are owned and operated by not-for-profit organizations who work closely with the municipality and the schools. And someone said, well, these multi-million dollar facilities ought to be taxable. And the legislature said, eh, no, we're going to exempt under the exclusion from the exempt from the under the limitation on the exclusion from the exemption properties as long as uh, during each calendar year the facilities provide uh, support 
for local public schools for uh, officially recognized by the Vermont Principals Association. So we talked yesterday about reading statutes and it's perfectly capable. Everyone is perfectly capable of reading and understanding a statute. As long as you apply those two rules, the most important of them being be sure you read the whole statute with all the nots, accepts, unlesses, limitations, read it all the way through. Personally, I draw diagrams um, and that that helps me uh, keep track of where I'm going with one of these complex things. So whatever works for you, as you try to apply these statutes, follow those general rules. All right, so um, let's jump over here. And back here. And then I did all the work for you. I went and dug up the case so you wouldn't have to go do that while we were talking. And the reason that I pulled up this case is because this was an important break point in the law of exemptions. And this case was decided in 1989. For those of you who may never have been to Manchester or may not recognize the American Museum of Fly Fishing, it was created by Orvis um, to show off their fly fishing equipment and ultimately all the add-ons and things that they added uh, as they became a large uh, retailer. And the um, Orvis went to the town of Manchester and said, hey, this is a public use um, property and it ought to be exempt. And the town said, mm, no. They said, hmm, well, we're going to go to Superior Court. And they did. And the Superior Court said, mm, no. And following their rights, like we talked about, they decided that they were going to go to the Vermont Supreme Court and ask the Vermont Supreme Court to tell everybody else that they were wrong and that this property ought to be exempt. And notice what we talked about yesterday, that the Supreme Court, in fact, determined that the trial court, Bennington Superior Court, got it wrong. And they said, we reverse. You're going to come up with the opposite result. This property is, in fact, exempt. Now, it wasn't because of anything the judge did. The judge actually applied the law as the judge understood it and probably got it right from that point of view. But the Supreme Court decided that we were going to implement a new test for when property fit the public use criteria exemption. So up until 1989, if you wanted to have a property that was exempt under the public use category, you had to show that your property served an essential governmental function. That means something that the government should be doing, might not have been doing, and this property and its owner, whoever they were, took on the responsibility of, of providing some function that normally the government would provide. And this is a good case. It won't help you particularly because, of course, the essential governmental function test doesn't apply any longer. But if you're interested in the history of your profession of assessment, it is interesting to read this um, because they, they go uh, pretty deep into the history of this. So some of the things they mentioned are that in order to be exempt, the property has to confer a benefit on that segment of the public, which the institution was designed to serve. Um, this particular case, the English language, English Language Center, Inc. versus Wallingford, the court held that exemptions are granted for the performance of service essentially public in nature on the theory that such public service benefits to the public 
benefits the public and in so doing assumes a share of the public burden. If the public should be paying for this service, then a non-public entity should not be taxed um, was sort of the circumstances. The um, going way back in our history, um, the, the court in determining that um, this particular uh, property rendered a benefit generally that the or, or did not render a benefit generally that in fact the Brattleboro Child Development Center was essentially private in nature concluding the benefit was tangential. It essentially said that look throughout the history of Vermont the government has supported schools um, and churches and that was true for years and years and years um every one of you had in your town land that was set aside could never be sold and was rented for the support of the gospel in vermont and if your town was settled before 1789 your town had before 1776 your town had set aside uh land that uh, belonged to the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts and was rented out to support the Episcopal Church's missionary. So. The, the trial court said, well, fly, you know, fly fishing's interesting. But promoting fly fishing isn't really a governmental or public purpose, so you're not exempt. And then the court went along and said exactly what we talked about, which was that we're going to gather the intent of what was meant by taking the whole and every part of the statute, the subject matter, the effects, the consequences, and the reason and the spirit of the law. And we're not going to construe a statute in a manner that defeats the purpose of it. That doesn't make any sense. So the court basically said, we're going to change the rules. Not really, but a little bit. Instead of looking for an essential government purpose that this property takes on, we are going to look for three things. And you don't have to try and read this mess as I tried to um, highlight it, uh, probably with too much coffee in my system because it looks a little shaky there. Um, instead, what we're going to look at is this. If you want an exemption, your property has to be dedicated unconditionally to public use. The primary use must directly benefit an indefinite class of persons who are part of the public and must also confer a benefit on society as a result of the benefit conferred on the persons directly served. And then the throwaway and the easiest one in the whole world, the property must be owned or operated on a nonprofit basis. All right. So. Um, there are some hard concepts in here. This one isn't so bad, the owned on a not-for-profit basis. I am going to caution you against one thing. When I was at PBR, we got a number of requests from listers, town managers, and folks asking for help to decide whether or not some borderline case was in fact entitled to an exemption. And one mistake that people, people often make is when it says the property must be owned and operated on a not-for-profit basis, a lot of people think that means it has to be owned by a corporation that is designated as a 501c3. And that is not the case. The designation 501c3 applies to taxes. And that an entity that meets the requirements for a 501c3 designation means that the donations that they take in are not taxable income. It also means they're probably a not for that, that they are, in fact, a not for profit, and they also meet about 36 other criteria. The application for 501c status is pretty impressive. Um, but you can have a not for profit entity, and there are many of them throughout this state, 
that are not 501c3s, 501c4s, or any one of the other 501s that the uh, Internal Revenue Service recognizes. So don't fall into the trap that, no, you don't qualify for an exemption because you're not a 501c3. That's not the issue. What you need to get is their articles of incorporation from the Secretary of State. They should have provided you with them when they applied for tax exempt, uh, for tax exempt status. But sometimes people who don't know a lot about what they're doing uh, don't know that. Once you get the articles, that's going to tell you if they are organized as a for-profit or not-for-profit corporation. As long as their articles say not-for-profit, they meet test three. But what about that middle test? That's a hard one because you have exempt organizations that don't necessarily serve everyone in the public. For instance, you could have a school or an organization whose purpose is to help people with visual impairments. That is a class of people. It is not everyone, but it also is not a group that is functionally self-limiting. As long as they serve any person with a visual impairment, they probably meet the requirement for um, indefinite class of people. And the reason I say that is because of this quote that I put up from the Rutland County Parent and Child Center versus the city of Rutland, which points out that when you're looking at definite indefinite class distinction, the question is, you have to show that the sort of the, the total scope of the people who might use this use, it's, they're looking for tax exemption for, um, they can't belong to an exclusive group, but private uses uh, uh, because an exclusive group is typically a private organization directed at a specific group of people. They are often a particular group of people limited um, by certain characteristics or membership, for instance. If you have to be a member of a club and they have to vote to let you in, that is not a public use. They, are, they, are, they have certain criteria to, to um, let you in. If the only criteria is that you have to be male or female, well, that, that probably still constitutes um, a public group if that's the only criteria, because that's a pretty broad criteria. So as you're looking at these things, if the criteria that they're giving you is pretty broad, well, they're, they're getting closer. You have to be careful, but they're getting closer. If the criteria is really narrow, like um, there was a case that was decided uh, that involved a um, old growth forest that had been set aside um, and the organization that owned it wanted tax exempt status because they didn't charge people to uh, access the forest. But, of course, there's the classic but, in order to access this particular forest, you had to apply and it had to be for specific purposes. So the forest was not available to the general public. It was only available to study the ecology of the old growth forest fail the tax exemption, because even though in theory, anyone in the public could ask for access, you would only get access if you had a specific study purpose that you could articulate in mind. So it's always a question of private users are generally finite and limited. They often involve a choice of selection or judgment in terms of who gets to benefit from the specific property that's being asked to be exempt. And so those that's the primary criteria you should be looking at. 
because the narrower the distinction, the less likely the public has access to this property. All right. So I told you that I was going to do some of the talking, but you're going to do some of the work here too. Um, and so we have a test. This is an interesting one. Um, you already know the law because I've mentioned it once already, but I'll give you a hint what the law you're going to apply is. And um, you're going to apply those clear and easy rules that we all understand about exemptions to determine in, determine if a property is exempt from property taxes. And here are the facts that you have to go on. All right, a college owns several buildings in this specific municipality. Some of those buildings are used for education, but one of the buildings is leased to the state of Vermont for non-education purposes. Should the building that's leased to the state of Vermont an exempt entity be exempt from property taxes. You need to know a few more facts because this was really important to the court when they decided the case. About a third of the building space is used for storage, and it happens that this is the building that hosts the telephone system that serves the school. So some of the rooms in the building are set aside for technology purposes um, for uh, phone and internet use. But the rest of the building is leased to the state. The school was exempt while the school operated there. This is one of those schools that mm, ran into some financial difficulties and started getting smaller and smaller and smaller until their programs fit in only a couple of the buildings on the campus and so they started doing other stuff with the buildings. But leading up to the question, is this property exempt or not? The structure of the building and the space didn't change and the rooms are similar to when the building would, was used for school. And in fact, if the school finds a use for the property again or another school wants to use the property, no changes to the property would have to be made. It could immediately again be used as a school. All right. So what are you going to ask? What's the, law? the big question is what's the law that applies? And the answer is. Besides, remember, this this is the policy. What we're trying to do is be sure that organizations that are exempt, this is a college, so it's exempt, 38024, to allow these organizations to dedicate financial resources to fur furthering their public service missions. And the law says, real and personal property, a state granted sequestered and used for public or pious charitable uses, which includes lands owned or leased by colleges, academies, and other public schools. Oh yeah, well, there's this other provision down here. The exemption doesn't apply to the lands or buildings rented for general commercial purposes. Well, wait a minute. This land was rented to the state of Vermont. A general commercial purpose. So what do you think? Um, I know what the outcome is. I know what the Supreme Court said. Um, I know what the municipality did. Um, some of you may too. If you happen to be from this specific municipality and you recognize this case, uh, don't um, underestimate, uh, don't, don't toss this out um, until we get some other folks out there. So uh, we've got our first answer, which is the rented property would not be exempt, but wouldn't the state uh, pay a pilot uh, payment to the town where the building is? No, the pilot wouldn't apply in this case because the state doesn't own the building. The school still owns the building. The state just leases it. So it would, as far as I know, pilot only applies when the state owns the building in the town. So uh, we have one not exempt. Do we have uh, other votes for not exempt or exempt? 
Ah, very good. We have someone who said, well, maybe what we should do is tax the rented portion of the building and leave the school the exempt uh, part um, not exempt. Oh, and we've got an exempt. We've got a rented part is not exempt. This is great. I love it when people participate. The first time I tried this, um, it was in a um, live program and the entire audience sat there and stared at me. So I really appreciate the fact that you folks are contributing here. Um, oh, and we've got another exempt. Do we have anybody else that wants to throw in a response here? Ooh, the exempts are winning. At least if you all were on the Supreme Court, I see a 3-2 three, three, decision here. All right, so I'm not really good with dead air. Um, so I am going to hop along here if anybody else wants to um, write the answer down on an index card and um, keep track of, of how it comes out. Um, I will tell you this secret. One of the other things that I do is I regularly teach programs to attorneys. And one of the styles of the program that I do is uh, involves people voting. So I pose a question just like I did to you and I ask them to vote. And the way they vote is you have a green card, a yellow card, and a red card. And I give you three choices. So um, what's always interesting to me, particularly in mixed audiences, because I often have paralegals as well as lawyers in the audience. So the paralegals always vote by holding the card way up in the air and waving it because they want to be sure that everybody knows what they voted. Every lawyer in the audience votes by holding up the card under their chin where no one else can see how they voted in case they voted wrong. So really appreciate you folks who are willing to go out here on a limb and talk about uh, and, and give us a vote. So the case that's involved here is Vermont College of Fine Arts versus the city of Montpelier. And I'm actually going to pull that case up and show it to you for a number of reasons not just because of the outcome of the case, but because there are a couple of important things in here that are really important for you to know about, and there's no particularly good reason why you should. So um, the court does exactly what they suggested, uh, what we told, we said they would. They, they give you a brief summary of the facts, they tell you what the decision was, and then they say we affirm. So what was the decision? Um, that the, oh, let me go back one step. This is one of those cases where there was no trial. The, the parties settled on the facts, told the court they agreed on the facts, and filed the motion for summary judgment that we talked about, then the court ruled. And the court ruled that, first of all, the college failed to follow the correct process. And second, the property wasn't exempt anyway. So, what are some of the things that you can learn from this case? Okay, so here's the first one, and it has nothing to do with assessments. Notice that the key player here is not even an assessor or a lister, but it's the city manager of Montpelier, who felt compelled to reach out to the College of Fine Arts president, tell him that the determination was coming, that the um, property would not be exempt, and then, interestingly, the city manager gives legal advice. Technically, tax-exempt status cannot be grieved, but practically, we would have until, say, July 1 to reach an accommodation. Well, that's wrong. Flat out wrong. He gave them bad advice, and they followed it resulting in an entire discussion here about how there is an administrative process with grievance to the listers, appeal to the Board of Civil Authority, and then you can go to court. 
But the College of Fine Arts, apparently relying on what the city manager told them, said, no, nah, we're going to skip that whole process. We're just going to go to court, file what's called a declaratory judgment action, and ask the court to declare our rights regarding this. And so the Supreme Court said, hmm, well, that's wrong. That the Board of Civil Authority can rule on questions of tax exempt status, and the college should have exhausted the administrative process before going to court. So, uh, first takeaway from this case don't give people legal advice. Tell them to talk to someone who can explain their rights to them. Particularly, don't give them wrong legal advice. All right. Um, just for your information, the Supreme Court continued on by saying um, that it's clear that the listers or the city assessor has the responsibility to determine if the property is tax exempt in the first case. Um, you can count uh, that the property owner, of course, can challenge through grievance and board of civil authority, but it is always up to you as listers or assessors in the first circumstance to determine if a property is tax exempt or not. And then, of course, the Supreme Court did what they're absolutely famous for. If they don't like the case, they would have stopped right here and said, because the city didn't follow the correct administrative procedure, there's no jurisdiction to hear this case. Case is thrown out. Yeah, but we kind of want to tell people what the right rule is here. So uh, even though, nevertheless, um, the whole case isn't here properly. We're going to tell you what the law is. And they did. And they, uh, they, the city, Montpelier, argued that there's no public use here because it's an educational institution. Um, the court sort of went along with the idea that this was a college and so should be determined under the college, not necessarily the uh, it, it doesn't have to fall under the public test. It can fall under the education test, but basically went on to determine that the property was fell under that exclusion from the exemption because it was leased for commercial purposes. And the reason that they found that was interesting because I happened to have been at PVR when this happened, and I happened to have seen the lease. Now, I don't know how much of an impact this had on the Supreme on the Supreme Court, but it certainly had a great impact on me as a uh, commercial real estate, a former commercial real estate attorney at that point. The lease itself had a provision in it, as do most commercial leases, which specified that the tenant, the state of Vermont, would pay the landlord, the college, any taxes assessed on the property. And not only would they pay the taxes that were assessed on the property, but if the taxes increased, then they would pay the increased taxes assessed on the property. If that is not a commercial term that suggests that no one thought this property was exempt, they can't think of a better piece of evidence to prove that. So that was the issue with the Vermont College of Fine Arts situation. All right. So that was good. All right. Let's do another exemption question. This one's fun too. Um, but this isn't a real case. I made this one. So uh, there is no right answer here. There is um, the, oh, uh, we had a question. What did the state sell? How is it commercial? The state didn't sell anything. Um, the state was using the property as storage and to host backup uh, systems because for those of you who know Montpelier, the College of Fine Arts is up on a hill and well out of the flood zone. Um, and that's where the state maintains one of its remote backup sites. Remember, commercial doesn't involve just sales. Commercial involves anything where the purpose of the transaction is to make money. And the college here was definitely in the mode of making money. They were struggling financially. Their enrollment was down. 
there were a number of circumstances that um, meant that they had to find alternate streams of income to keep their operation going. And so they leased the property for uh, non-education purposes, which is where they ran into an issue. An interesting question, if you analyze some of the um, exempt tech, the exempt cases, if the landlord and the tenant share a mission, even though the property is leased by one to the other, it may still qualify for an exemption. The question is how close do they share the mission and how do the exchange of resources work? Um, but don't, don't assume commercial means sales. Commercial means anything where the purpose is to make money. All right, back to my exemption question. So this is a good one. Um, I'm going to tell you in advance, I don't know the answer either. I have an idea of what I would say the answer was, but I'm not a lister, I'm not an assessor. I am not a judge, never will be a judge because no one's ever going to ask me to be a judge. So um, whatever you answer here is simply your analysis of this fact. Matter. So here we go. We have a nonprofit entity which operates campus where it presents artist in residence programs for artists of all types. They actually have two programs in operation. There's a program for established artists who can apply and are invited based on creating a mix of inspire uh, a mix of artists to inspire each other. So my contemplation here would be that you would have people who paint and draw and write and create visual arts, maybe fabric arts, anything that represents an artistic element. And the idea is you get people of different um, disciplines together. And by being around each other, they inspire each other. So that's the first goal of my program here. The second program is for new artists. Anybody can apply um, and you don't submit portfolios. You don't do any of that stuff. You're selected if it looks like you're someone who might become an artist. All right, so a couple of key criteria. An established artist has to submit a portfolio as part of the application process. The new artist program, you only have to express an intent to pursue art. Um, either as a career or merely for fun. Um, nobody pays. The, the, everything is provided free. The campus includes studios, meeting spaces, performance spaces, and museum spaces. The artists' works that are created during each of the programs are collected and displayed and presented in galleries and in events open to the public. All right, so. Uh, again, I'm going to give you a hint about what the law is. And here you go. Back to the fly fishing case. This is the test you're going to apply. So what do you think? Does my artist's colony qualify for an exemption or not? We got a quick no. Wow. I won't be opening this in Westmore. Oh, we got an exempt. All right. So one not exempt, one exempt. Oh. Two, we got another exemption. Hmm, we got a split now. 
you got to get one deciding vote. It's two and two. Oh, three. Um, if it were the Vermont Supreme Court and they voted that way, I win. My artist's colony would qualify for an exemption. All right, so let's go back and think a little bit about these three elements. The property must be dedicated unconditionally to a public use. Yeah. Um, OK, so good analysis there. If the Secretary of State's office lists the owner as a nonprofit, um, it does confer benefit on society and it would be public as far as anyone can apply, just like a college exempt. Uh, doesn't mention if the pictures are sold in the gallery, which I assume would make a difference. Otherwise, I would say exempt. All right, so I, I think I agree that that this property probably meets the first test dedicated unconditionally to a public use. We know that as time has passed, the encouragement of the arts has become a significant element in the public world. Governments encourage arts. Governments encourage entities that encourage arts. So I would give them um, the public use. Uh, I did say it was operated on a not-for-profit basis, so the owner is a not-for-profit. Um, and it all falls down to this one. Directly benefit an indefinite class of persons who are part of the public and confer a benefit on society as a result of the benefit conferred. And frankly, I'll tell you where I came down on this when I was analyzing it, though, as I said, I don't know this is the right answer. I would have said exempt. And the reason for that is because based on my somewhat limited collection of facts here, most of the building is more public directed than private directed. Yes, there is a problem. And for those of you who said not exempt, you have a very good reason right here, which is the established artists who have to submit a, por par a portfolio as part of the application process, and they have to be chosen. This is the Johnson case, the, the artist colony there that operates purely by selecting people based on their portfolio, tried to get an exemption and failed because it wasn't directed at the public. It was directed at a very narrow band of people who already had artistic skills and could pass the test. So those of you who said not exempt, if this is what you were focusing on, you're absolutely right. One of the questions that you really should ask if you if this came up, if I show up in your town and ask for this is what's the mix? Is 90% of the artists there a part of this established artist program? And you kind of throw in that little public thing by saying, well, we'll take 10 people who don't know anything about art and we'll try and teach them something. OK. Too much of a focus on the private elements. That is a problem. But for those of you who focused on the museum, that is another point. If the non-established artist program plus the museum constituted a significant piece of this program, that pushes you closer to exempt because typically museums are exempt unless they're only directed at a narrow group of people. You have to be a member to get in. They're not really open to the public. You know, they open up one day, a, one day a month just to claim that the public can use them. But it, it's, you know, the third Wednesday, if it's not raining uh, kind of thing, that doesn't necessarily work for open to the public. But certainly museums themselves are generally um, can qualify assuming they meet the other two criteria, as long as they're, they are in fact open to the public. So this was a good one because I wanted to throw in both elements of the private focus and the public focus to get you thinking about what 
is this primary use directly benefit an indefinite class of persons who are part of the public and must also confer a benefit on society as a result of the benefit conferred on persons directly served. And it's a terrible mouthful of words, but the idea is really focus on how narrow a group of people are served by this particular use. All right, uh, and you gave us our decision. OK, one more because I can't resist. I love watching people think about things. So we have a not for profit organization that owns a parcel of land, including substantial acreage and some buildings. On the land are located several small buildings. They're actually former farm buildings, which are now cleaned up and used as chapels or prayer meditation spaces. Each of the spaces is decorated to suggest the elements of one of the world religions. There are custodians who care for the property, but none of them purport to be ministers, priests, or religious instructors. Guests are meant to experience the site on their own. So you're invited to come. You're invited to go wherever you want on the property to reflect, pray, meditate, simply observe the beauty, whatever. Uh, part of the open space is dedicated to walking trails with stations, including uh, religious or inspirational quotes. The remaining space is undeveloped. So the welcome center at the entrance includes displays suggesting further development of the open space that depends on donations from users. Anyone may visit the area and donations are requested, but not required. So what do you think about that one? So we have a quick not exempt. We've got other people who are thinking. Ah, interesting. One of you suggests that there may be a partial exemption. I'm assuming that the developed part of the property might be deemed exempt, but the undeveloped part would be the part you would say was not exempt. I got that right. Are they a not-for-profit? Yes, they are a not-for-profit. You're all going to be great lawyers. We got a not exempt, an exempt, and a partly exempt. Every possible answer. The perfect lawyer outcome. Ask any question of three lawyers, you'll get three different answers, none of which will exactly compare to each other. Uh, the not exempt is because there are no priests, ministers, or religious instructors. It's an interesting point. I hadn't really focused on that. I OK, so we've got someone who said this is clearly an indefinite group of people because anyone is welcome to come. They don't specify a specific religion. They simply invoke, let's say, all religions. Well, to be honest, I didn't really know the answer to this one. Uh, I would be inclined to vote for exempt. Um, I think it could fit the public use test. Um, uh, interesting question. How would they pay taxes if they were required to? Well, we bump up those donations. Um, my inclination would be <clears throat> that this would fall not under the church exemption, so if we go way back here, way back here, it's not in the green because it's clearly not owned by a church, church society, or conference. But I think it could fit under the definition of bias. Um, and that's where I was going when I created this structure of facts which is pious doesn't necessarily mean a specific um, 
religion. Uh, Vermont has a long history of public support for religion. Um, you know, there was the the original lease lands were set aside for uh, worship. The first settled minister in the towns that were created under the Wentworth grants. Uh, so the first minister that came and settled in town would be given a grant of land to support the minister. Uh, I, I would give this one an exemption. I think it fits, but I'm not unsympathetic to the people who said not exempt, uh, probably because it fails to identify any specific religion, so it clearly doesn't fit under the church exemption. All right, so. Um, and of course, I threw in the big piece of land um, not under development um, at the time because I wanted to lead into this case. Uh, and I apologize every time I do this program to this poor man. I don't actually know how to pronounce the name, but I'm going with Zalata versus the town of South Hero. And this is a fascinating case. Um, the taxpayer owned 9.9 .9 acres with an 11,500 square foot garage used exclusively to store and repair, repair classic automobiles. What's the hook that potentially makes this exempt? There is a separate museum on a different piece of land where the autumn, where a subset of the automobiles are displayed. I think um, Chase mentioned that the uh, person owned about 40 cars and at any given time, six or seven of the cars were on display in the museum. The taxpayer's claim was that because the garage supported the operation of the tax exempt museum, the garage and all nine acres were exempt. The municipality asserts that the garage itself doesn't meet the fly fishing test and is therefore taxable. And I asked the question of who won and why, and I'm going to tell you because I pulled up the case for you. And there we go. So interesting. Again, this was a summary judgment case. There was no reason to try the facts. Everyone knew exactly what the facts were. Um, and um, the uh, court, based on the facts that were given, held that the garage and the land were exempt because they met the public use test. The city, uh, the town appealed. Uh, and went to the uh, Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, goes to a very detailed recitation of the facts. Um, and uh, I highlighted this because I thought this was an interesting point to raise. The town pointed out that um, at one point, the owner of the property had never applied for and obtained permission to operate in the state of Vermont. So although they were operating as an entity, they didn't have permission from the Secretary of State's office. They hadn't registered with the Secretary of State's office. And so they shouldn't have been entitled to a tax exemption. And more importantly, the town argued exactly as several of you did, which was, well, the undeveloped land doesn't do anything to support the museum. It's just there. So the whole 9.9 .9 acres can't be exempt. Maybe the belt with the town didn't agree, but you could read into it. OK, if we have to lose on something, maybe the garage and some small portion of the land that the garage sits on uh, should be exempt. Um, so the first thing the court said, look, the exemption statute doesn't say anything about having permits to operate. It doesn't in, uh, it doesn't include zoning permits. It doesn't include any of that as an element of whether or not the exemption. And so we're not going to read those requirements in. One of the other potential defects with the uh, Zolotov property was there was a period of time which they did not have the appropriate permits to operate the garage. So um, the court tosses that argument pretty quick by pointing out that there's nothing in the tax exemption statute that says you have to have permits to operate. Um, the, the court says, look, our history has always been if a property is 
in support of and operates in conjunction with an exempt property, it can qualify for an exemption. The classic one was Shelburne Museum against the town of Shelburne when uh, Shelburne Museum uh, knowledge that the museum itself was tax exempt, but said that the house that the museum director lived in should have been taxed. And the um, Supreme Court said no. The house that the museum director lived in had more elements of a public building because the museum director was expected to host events, bring in big donors, entertain big donors, do all that sort of stuff in their house. So in that Supreme Court case, uh, the town of Shelburne lost. The Shelburne Museum got their property exempt, uh, or at least their um, museum director's house exempt because of the way it was used. The court does a good job of binding the facts together. Pointing out that, you know, it, it's clear that if the museum has 40 vehicles, but they can only display seven, they got to go somewhere. And this made sense um, that they uh, uh, were storing them there. And then the town did something that is really, really, really a bad idea if you're litigating one of these. They tried to raise a new argument at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't operate that way. You have to give the trial court, the hearing officer, the administrative uh, determine, uh, people determining the outcome of this particular case. You have to give them all your arguments. You can't think up a really good one after you finish at the trial court level. Now, we all know that you only think of the best response to something that somebody said to you as you're driving home from wherever you were when they said it to you, but that doesn't work in court. You have to make and raise all your arguments and all of the necessary facts <clears throat> at each level. So be thinking about that when you are representing the town at the Board of Civil Authority and in court or before a hearing officer you want to be sure you get in all your facts and all your arguments. The town tried to raise the argument, well, not all of the land supports the building, and so some of the land should not be exempt. And the court said, maybe you're right. That's a perfectly reasonable legal principle, but because you didn't raise it um, below in the lower court decision, um, you can't raise it here and we're not going to take it up. So um, that was basically the uh, Zolotov case. There's a fair amount of words in there. Uh, this is one of those interesting cases. There's no dissent, but the court had to explain a lot of things that they talked about in the opinion, so they stuck a bunch of footnotes in. Uh, one of those things that you learn when you're reading a case, if you see the footnote uh, notation um, following a statement, you always want to go down and read the footnote. Don't ignore the footnotes because sometimes they give you a really good explanation for why they chose to do something. All right, so uh, moving on. Um, we talked about exempt property, so churches, but remember, it's not just the churches. There are those other things in 3832, libraries we know. There are veterans exemptions um, that have very, very specific and special requirements. So if you have someone looking for a veterans exemption, be sure you're following the precise procedure laid out in the statute for that. Um, we have federally qualified health centers and federally designated health clinics, although there are some limitations and they primarily relate to the fact that if the clinic or the health center operates doctor's offices, but rents the offices out, doesn't operate them under its federal charter, um, that may affect their exemption. Uh, solar generators generating less than 50 kilowatts as long as they're not metered or not connected to the grid which means serving only the property on which it's located. Um, so uh, real and personal property owned by a charitable nonprofit organization de devoted to the welfare protection and humane treatment of animals. Um, and then the new one that I mentioned yesterday when we were talking about statutes, 
a uh, real and personal property owned by a Native American tribe that meets the recognition requirements in 1 BSA Chapter 23 and uh, property owned by some collateral organizations that are directly related to the uh, Native uh, American tribe. Um, the, uh, and I apologize, uh, apologize for the quality of this case, drag and drop and, and, and running it out didn't do a great job of creating this slide. Um, but be aware that in Chapter 25, after they deal with the exemptions and the limitations on exemptions, there are a specific list of um, exempt properties, uh, including things like college, university, not so much fraternity properties anymore. Um, there are exemptions for airports. I'm going to mention this exemption for a hotel because I think it is so cool that it's in there. Municipally owned lakeshore property, charitable and fraternal organizations, uh, renewable energy resources, neighborhood housing improvement programs. Um, so much of stuff. You should be aware of it if, if it comes up and people are looking for exemptions. So let me move on. Uh, we talked about 3832. So one of the interesting ones, I don't know how many of you know, but technically railroad property, uh, property of railroad corporations are exempt from the general property tax, but that's only because there is a separate process for collecting a tax on railroad properties. And I got to give credit to Doug Lay because he took a whole afternoon to explain that entire process to me and how they use a complex web of spreadsheets to collect information on the current value of the assets of the railroad and then apply depreciation factors to result in a value to which a tax rate is applied. And then those lucky towns in which um, railroad assets are located are given a payment. They divide up the, the railroad's gross tax and distribute it among the towns where the um, railroad owns property. And my recollection is from looking at that, uh, it wouldn't buy copy for the select board uh, at more than about three meetings um, on any of the distributions possibly with the exception of those few towns where there are fairly large railroad yards because they typically involve a lot of real estate. All right, so moving on, um, we uh, are back to 3832. The exemption shall not be confused as exempting. Property owner kept as an orphanage, home, hospital, or uh, uh, and, and the key one here is hospital, of course including diagnostic and treatment centers not used for the purpose of such institution, but leased to others for income or profit, whether or not the institution is uh, conducted or connected to a religious society, unless the town or municipality in which the property is located so votes at a regular or special meeting duly warned. Uh, back to our favorite um, exemption, I mentioned the hockey rinks, but this is that fairly complex sentence. What I find interesting is that there is also an exemption for health, recreation, and fitness centers, which are owned by 501c3s. And here it is specific. The exemption only applies to people who are a 501c3. And like I said, that's a very difficult designation to get. But anyone who comes to you and is looking for an exemption for that specific property, um, they are going to have a letter uh, from the Internal Revenue Service saying that they are duly qualified as a 501c3 organization, and if they can't produce it, the exemption doesn't apply. It uses its income entirely for the exempt purpose, which is operating the health, recreation, and fitness organization, and <clears throat> we throw in that uh, public purpose to promote exercise and healthy lifestyles, for the community and serve the citizens of all income levels, thereby uh, sort of statutorily incorporating our fly fishing uh, test case. All right, a um, couple of the exemptions we talked about involve the town voting for the exemptions. Be aware that there are time limits. So 
you, the listers, should be part of the organization that is keeping track of when was the exemption voted on, how long is the exemption good for, when is it going to expire, do we want to remind the select board, city council, whoever, put it back on the ballot to vote for the exemption again as it's expiring so there's no gap. You want to you want to vote for the exemption at the appropriate time so that there's no gap if it's your intent that the exemption continue. And then because, as I mentioned, when we were talking about exemptions or when we were talking about statutes and cases, actually. The existence of these oddball statutes and the. Um, sort of the history behind them and why they came to be have always fascinated me. So there is an exemption for factories, quarries and mines. And I love this criteria that starts it off. If the amount invested in the factory, quarry or mine exceeds a thousand dollars. Do you think the legislature hasn't looked at this statute in a while? Um, I am reasonably certain that an entity that wanted to create a factory, a quarry, or a mine could not get their registration with the Vermont Secretary of State for less than $1,000. Maybe if they had someone working for them in-house so they weren't actually paying legal fees to do it, but then um, the exemption would apply to manufacturing establishments, quarries, mines, machinery, tramways, appliances, buildings necessary for the use in the business, machinery and unoccupied buildings, capital and personal property may be exempted from taxation for a period not exceeding 10 years from the commencement of business if the town so votes. I suspect that no one in your town has voted on this exemption in the living memory of anyone in town. Um, I found this one fascinating that um, is a voted exemption for newly constructed or under constructed homes. Uh, it's good for 12 months. And it uh, exempts from taxes the first $75,000 of appraised value for buildings. So this is an interesting one. You know, uh, according to the governor, the legislature, and everybody else, we're in a housing crisis. It's expensive to build housing. If your town is really interested, in encouraging the construction of housing in your town, it might be worth looking at doing something like this to give people who are coming to town to build um, or who are in the process of building, frankly, a bit of a break on their taxes, but it does require a vote and the exemption won't exceed three years. All right, and we're back to my favorite one on hotels. Remember last time I told you that the hotels are required to tell you about anybody who's living there. So in your prior life, you would go and get their inventory of their personally owned property. Well, in theory, a hotel can be exempted from property taxes for a period not to exceed five years. Um, when a majority of those voting at the annual meeting vote in favor. Um, but a vote in favor of that exemption is not valid unless it shall appear that the total grand list of such majorities equal to at least one half the total grand list of those voting on the question. So I suppose in a town meeting 100 years ago, when almost everybody who lived in town was at town meeting, and we all knew what everybody's property was worth, you as one of the listers or the town clerk or the town treasurer or someone would be able to say that, look, the majority um, who voted for that, yeah, you know, so uh, Joe's farm and Ellie's farm and the back road farm there, well, together they, they represent at least 50% of our grand list. So since the three of them voted for this, um, we met that test. But, when the majority of those voting on the question of the exemption at a special meeting vote in favor thereof, the vote is not valid unless it shall appear that the majority is equal in number to one third of the total number of legal voters in the town, nor unless it shall appear that the total grand list of such majority is equal to at least one half the total grand list of those voting on the question. I'm going to guess that 
as listers, you will never be asked to assess this particular exemption. But if you are, remember to bring your, cal your calculator to the meeting. All right, so we are at the end of this session. It is 2.33, I did pretty good, came pretty close. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. All right, so um, Jen, we good to go? I think you're all set. Go for it. OK. All right. So um, as we start the session four here, um, you'll notice I, I finally gave up putting the disclaimer in. I figured you, you, you were sick of hearing that. So uh, let's dive straight into the appeal process. and um i'm i'm throwing up a few things that you already know because if you've been a lister for more than about a week you probably already had to go through this um but i will mention that we are we are dealing primarily with the materials in title 32 uh chapter 129 and specifically here we're dealing with subchapter 5 which is the grievance process so um the couple of things I know you probably work if, if you're a new if you're a new lister you probably work with experienced listers um, but just let me throw out this that you have a statutory obligation to hear and consider anyone who has filed their objections in writing and based on some of the things that the courts have said over time the objections don't have to be very detailed and they don't have to be right. They just have to be something in writing that conveys to you um, what this person thinks is wrong about their tax assessment. Uh, I suspect that the majority of, of objections you get are uh, the assessments too high or probably not even the assessments too high. Probably what you get are my taxes are too high. Anyway, um, the process requires that you actually consider any grievance that's filed, even if nobody shows up to argue it. This I found interesting. I actually wasn't aware of this until I started um, researching for this program, that the statute specifically says that, that, not, that you must consider, even if they fail to appear, and you have to give them notice of your determination. Now, the statute doesn't say how significant your determination has to be if nobody shows up to present any evidence or argument, but you should at least be able to show that there is a record that you had a discussion about whether or not there are any errors in the assessment, whether or not this particular property for some reason is out of balance with the other properties of a similar class because you don't want someone to be able to argue that you failed to follow the statutory process in considering the appeal. All right. Uh, another one that I periodically get a question about um, is uh, what if somebody pays their taxes? Well, according to the statute, if you pay your taxes without protest, even though the taxes were built on an effective or invalid grand list, um, you can't file an objection. The same statute for some reason also mentions that of course, anyone who's filing agreements can submit evidence under oath or in documentary form as long as it's relevant to the, uh, to the uh, proceedings. All right. Uh, this one, uh, I always have to have someone explain it to me, but there are circumstances under which, of course, uh, the grand list may make a change uh, after the, the standard time period, and the statute provides for an appeal anytime there's a change to someone's listed value. And this uh, 4407 tells you the, the timing and the process. All right, so this is a key one. This is one that you need to pay attention to. Um, in my experience, in every profession that I have ever worked in, there are 
people, not necessarily you, but there are people involved who have varying levels of desire to comply with the details of the requirements of their job. And so I threw up a couple of things here that you should be aware of. That is, um, you must buy the date by which the date with any extensions. You have to give notice in writing of the changes. And you have to um, tell the people, tell your taxpayers that they can, if they don't like your decision, they can appeal to the Board of Civil Authority and the process, which is to file the appeal with the town clerk within 14 days of the written notice. And then I highlighted this in red because just recently um, I've noticed a trend uh, that does not involve the town, does not involve the listers, but involves the United States Postal Service. And the statute specifies that unless the personal notices required by this section were sent by registered or certified mail, or unless an official certificate of mailing of the same was obtained from the post office, in the case of any controversy subsequently arising, it shall be presumed that the personal notices were not mailed as required. Now, I assume, perhaps wrongly, but I assume that when you send out your notices, you probably send them by regular mail. Um, I don't know if you use certified mail in every case. If you do, great, because now you've got proof of mailing, proof of delivery. If you don't use certified mail, you might want to consider whether you should or not. Now, I realize if you've got two or 300 grievances on a 15,000 parcel grand list, that sending out 300 um, certified letters is both extremely challenging and based on my recent experience of sending five of them, incredibly expensive. But just be aware that you may be deemed to have failed to have give proper notice if you can't prove the notice went out. One of the things that I worry about is I have heard more and more stories about post offices and not just in smaller areas, but in some of our bigger municipalities where mail goes unsorted or undelivered for extended periods of time. It is going to be a grand question. What happens if you timely send out your notice and the post office doesn't deliver it for a month. The 14 days has passed during which the uh, person can appeal. But is someone going to look at that, and by someone I mean a judge, and say, it wasn't the town's fault, it wasn't the taxpayer's fault, we're not going to penalize the taxpayer for having not timely file when when the, someone raises the objection for civil authority, the appeal was timely filed, which is a valid objection. And so I suspect that we will over time, you know, you come back to this program a couple of years from now. Um, I actually don't know if we have any repeat attendees or not. Um, and I might be talking about how to deal with the circumstance where the post office fails to deliver one of your notices. All right. So switching over to the Board of Civil Authority, which some of you may have experience with, some of you may not. Obviously, the appeal from your determination goes first to the Board of Civil Authority. We talked about that in the city of Montpelier case where uh, the city manager gave the bad advice that there was no appeal to the Board of Civil Authority and the court corrected him and said that you absolutely must follow the administrative procedure. So. The um, appeal to the Board of Civil Authority requires both a notice of appeal and, uh, as highlighted in red, the grounds for appeal. We will uh, hopefully have a moment to take a look at the um, case that, that raises this particular question. One of the side issues in that particular case was the fact that the uh, taxpayer complained that the Board of Civil Authority decision was really bad. Um, and 
Likewise, I assume that periodically the Board of Civil Authority complains that the taxpayer's notice of appeal is really bad because there are no detailed explanations. There's some general statement about the uh, their assessment's too high because their house really isn't that good or something that doesn't get very far. Well, the courts have generally held that until you get to the court system, when it says give notice, the standard, the bar is pretty low as long as anybody can make out anything from this particular um, set of proceedings. The, uh, it's likely going to be allowed to continue, particularly at the Board of Civil Authority. So, all right, so um, obviously, if you're a lister, you can't sit on the Board of Civil Authority because there is no, no court, no system in the world where the person who makes the decision below gets to sit on the board to which or to the entity to which the appeal is filed and pass on their own decision. So um, you are certainly statutorily authorized to so-called prosecute and defend suits where the town is interested. Um, you uh, are certainly the best person sort of having expert witnesses, which is pretty unusual with the Board of Civil Authority, to convey the, your own assessment of the value of this property and the reasons how you came to that assessment and to explain to the Board of Civil Authority how you arrived there. And uh, at that point, depending on how big the challenge is, um, I've seen Taxpayers bring lawyers or bring professionals to the um, poor civil authority, but often it's just taxpayer. And sometimes as long as the taxpayer understands the process that you went through to um, put this together, uh, maybe they say, oh, okay. Maybe they don't, but in any event, it is definitely up to you to make a good presentation to the Board of Civil Authority. It's also, frankly, good practice if the appeal goes the next step, either to court or to a hearing officer, because there you're going to become a key witness or a key participant. And by doing a good job at the Board of Civil Authority level, that gives you the chance to get your case, your presentation together, and be sure you've got all the pieces that you want to present, that you've got them in a reasonable order. And most important of all, any circumstance where you're working on a disputed issue, that you're telling a good story because people respond to a good story. So just keep that in mind. All right. So the Board of Civil Authority process uh, involves a hearing. Uh, before the board, and then uh, an inspection by a subcommittee of the board, it's three members, and then the board has to um, consider the report of the inspection committee, and then a decision is made. Now, uh, I highlighted an interesting uh, point in red. Um, that if the taxpayer refuses to allow the Board of Civil Authority Committee to inspect the property, then the appeal is deemed withdrawn and the appeal comes to an end. I don't know how many times that happened. I know of two because the two cases reached the Vermont Supreme Court. There is the Garbatelli case. And there is the Rasmussen case I mentioned when we were talking about um, her decisions. That I particularly liked the Rasmussen case for a very personal reason. It was the first, it was the first appeal to the director that I ever had to deal with when I was serving as the director. And um, of course, the first one I got was not a typical one. It was the town raising the question that because 
the taxpayer refused to allow an inspection of the entire property, which at that point consisted of the primary residence, two rental units on three adjacent lots. So of course it was a single parcel under the definition of parcel. The taxpayer wouldn't let the Board of Civil Authority inspection party into the primary residence. They couldn't, he, he would let them inspect the two rental properties because in his mind, all he was appealing was the value on the two rental properties. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. It's a parcel. The statutory definition of a parcel is absolutely clear. Board of Civil Authority has the obligation, right, and duty to inspect the entire parcel and render its report. Because you didn't let them, your appeal was properly denied. Um, honestly, when someone asked me if I thought that would stand up, I was very fortunate because the attorney uh, who works in the tax department and provides uh, advice to PBR knew about the Garbatelli case. And having looked at that, I said, well, yeah, it looks like it should work. So that's what we went with. Um, because I, of course, was doing this program during the pandemic, I did have to point out that during a declared state of emergency, there were no inspections, uh, but the declared state of emergency expired three years ago, and we don't have to worry about that. All right. So <clears throat> within 15 days of the date of the report, the Board of Civil Authority has to write down its decision, and it has to include reasons. Now, the question went to the Supreme Court because the taxpayer thought that the Board of Civil Authority didn't do a great job of writing down their reasons, and the court basically agreed that the decision at the Board of Civil Authority was not a model of judiciary, judicial writing, but gave the Board of Civil Authority a bit of a pass and said they did express some reasons. And that was all that was required at the BCA level. And because, as we're going to learn in a minute, if you appeal to the director uh, at PBR or if you go into court, everything that happened before is ignored. So the court said, look, even if the Board of Civil Authority decision wasn't very good, it doesn't matter because once you appeal from that decision to another level, everything the Board of Civil Authority and frankly, everything the listers presented in either grievance or Board of Civil Authority doesn't matter. So we start over. But what is important and obviously you have nothing to do with this because you don't sit on the Board of Civil Authority. Should the board fail to comply with its requirements, essentially the grand, uh, the, the taxpayer, the appealing taxpayer's grand list freezes at the value um, before, um, for the year for which the appeal is being made remains at the amount set before the appeal to change was made by the listers. So if you increased someone's listing and then the Board of Civil Authority blows it by not following the proper procedure and not getting a buy from some court up the line saying, well, they got pretty close, um, then essentially the listed value is going to go back to what it was before you made the change. That, of course, has a potentially interesting effect if you lower the value of um, a listing. And because the Board of Civil Authority does a bad job and no appeal is taken, then in theory, the listed value would go back up because the statute is clear. It, it doesn't go down. It remains at the amount set before the appeal to change was made by the listers. Um, obviously, the Board of Civil Authority is required to send out a notice, and this is the case. It's Hansen versus Irisburg, uh, that the BCA has to provide reasons, um, but doesn't really matter because ultimately an appeal uh, from the BCA decision is what we call a de novo appeal or done over again, all new. So, uh, oops, I see a comment popped up. I have a taxpayer whose mailbox was damaged by the flood, so no mail. 
They filed an appeal with the town clerk knowing the 14 days were approaching. They now want to meet with me for an explanation of the denial of appeal. Can I discuss this with the taxpayer at this point prior to the Board of Civil Authority? My, I can't point to a statute case or any logical reason why um, you um, shouldn't be able to discuss with the taxpayer at this point. If the two of you were to come to an understanding, you could both go to the Board of Civil Authority and say, we fixed it. We want you to set the value at this, which is the value that both of us agreed on. And the Board of Civil Authority should be thrilled to do that because it makes their job easier. So this is not like a court proceeding where it is highly not recommended for you to talk to the opposing party directly except through the procedures uh, of appeal. But at your level of grievance at the Board of Civil Authority, if the two of you, taxpayer and town, can get together and make a deal, I'm not aware of anything that prohibits you from doing that. All right, um, so I don't like the Board of Civil Authority decision, and there's no reason why um, I shouldn't, uh, there's no reason why I can't appeal. So what do I do? I file a notice of appeal with the town and my choices are to go to EVR uh, and appeal to the director or to the superior court. And interestingly, in this case, um, the statute specifies that there are no juries in these trials and that makes perfect sense. There's no reason why 12 people would make a better decision than a judge in this case, because typically tax appeals are what I would call a fairly technical um, proceeding. They don't involve a lot of disputed facts, frankly. Um, yeah, you may not agree on the level of, of uh, finish, um, but you certainly ultimately will come to a resolution if the question is, did the house have five bedrooms or four bedrooms? And um, those kinds of things. And when you get into income valuation, that can be a whole lot trickier, but it's still a pretty technical determination. What constitutes income? What constitutes expenses? What's the right cap rate? And then it's math. Um, so those kinds of things are ideal for a judge to do and not ideal when you have to explain the entire process to the jury while people who don't really know what's going on. It's not like a car accident or, or a defamation case from yesterday or uh, cases where People's perception of what happened and how things are described is really relevant to at least finding the facts in a court case. So that's why there are no juries. Um, then the um, as soon as you file the, the, the appeal with the town clerk, and notice you're filing the appeal with the town clerk, not with the court. Uh, people actually get this wrong periodically, but when you when you appeal a decision, you you file the appeal with the body that made the decision because they then become responsible for shipping the files and the notice and everything off to the party that's going to hear the appeal. Um, I checked the statute still says the cost is seventy dollars. That hasn't gone up in a while, I don't believe. Uh, if you're appealing to the director, it is substantially more if you're appealing in superior court. All right. Um, interesting. Until I worked at PVR, I didn't realize this was the circumstance that um, if the town doesn't like the decision of the Board of Civil Authority, the town agent can, in fact, file an appeal if one or more taxpayers of the town, and here we go again, math, whose combined grand list represents at least 3% of the grand list of the town, 
um, requ requests it, the town agent can file an appeal in Superior Court. Apparently, the town can appeal directly to the director, but if this process is followed, which is um, petition is raised to uh, file an appeal and you get 3% of the grand list to the town, which in some towns would be a very large number. Um, in some towns, it probably wouldn't be all that large, but they're also probably the towns that don't have a lot of people who own a lot of the land. So this seems to me to be a fairly challenging way to get an appeal filed uh, on behalf of the town, but I'm sure it's happened. Once the appeal is filed, it is possible for the town to, um, when the appeal goes to the director, to file a notice of objections that maybe the appeal wasn't filed timely. Maybe the this is how the director finds out that the um, individual taxpayer didn't allow the Board of Civil Authority inspection subcommittee on the property. Um, however, it happens or for whatever reason, and timeliness is probably the key one, but this is actually how Rasmussen got ramped up and running through the um, process. The director is obligated to hold a hearing and figure out if the appeal has a legitimate basis and should proceed uh, or isn't allowed to proceed and render a decision. Obviously, if the director determines that the um, appeal can't proceed, that's appealable. But if the director says, no, the appeal can proceed, the decision to allow the appeal to proceed is not itself an appealable decision. So then the appeal will work out. But the aggrieved party after who doesn't like the decision that came out of PVR would be able to include in its appeal, well, this should never have been heard in the first place for this reason. All right. Um, and like I mentioned a minute ago, uh, if the appeal is in process, the parties can always agree before anything happens. In fact, there are guidelines for hearing officers what to do if the parties settle before the hearing on the appeal. Um, so if you can get together with the taxpayer and figure out a solution that makes everybody happy, and you can stipulate is the official word, is the technical word, to a decision, it is possible that the appeal does not have to go through and you can simply make, uh, make your agreement to um, end the process and then the appeal is withdrawn. All right. So we're going to start with appeals to hearing officers. And the hearing officer is a statutorily created position. A hearing officer does not work for the state of Vermont. Happens they're paid by the state of Vermont. They do not work for the state of Vermont. They are purely independent individuals. Often they are people who are either former appraisers uh, former lawyers or current lawyers. Interestingly, if you want to be a judge in Vermont, you have to show that you have some experience in adjudicating disputes, not as, an, not as a uh, representative, not as a lawyer, but as the person who makes the decision. So a lot of lawyers who have their eye on becoming a judge will either volunteer to be small claims court judges, which is a great way to get experience if you think being involved in small claims is a good thing. Um, but the other way that people used to do it was to volunteer to become a hearing officer, um, and that would give them the uh, tagline on their resume that they were a, a property valuation hearing officer, and uh, gets them that sort of check mark that says, oh, well, these people have acted like judges before. The hearing officer has the statutory power to subpoena documents, records, and witnesses. In theory, if someone 
has documents that are relevant to a case, the hearing officer can issue an official demand, produce the documents to produce records, and in fact, to produce witnesses. The statute specifies that hearings are contested cases under the Administrative Procedures Act. That is a section of the statute I didn't talk about. Maybe I'll think about throwing in something on that if I do this program again. Um, and it lays out how administrative bodies, so state agencies primarily, but administrative law judges um, deal with cases. Uh, and it has stuff like conflict of interest principles. So you can't be uh, a, a judge or hearing officer in a case that you have an interest in. So for example, I can't be a hearing officer on a case uh, that involves South Burlington property because even though South Burlington has a huge grand list and, and the house that I'm hearing an appeal on would be a very small percentage of the, the grand list and, and the change would be a very small percentage, it would still in theory affect my obligation to pay taxes. And so I would be disqualified. I would, I would not uh, sit on that hearing. Um, I know that there are lawyers who represent towns in various transactions, if they decide to become hearing officers, they at least have to wait a number of years after they stopped representing the town before they can hear disputes in there because of a potential conflict of interest. And there are procedures, it talks about rules, it talks about evidence, it talks about all kinds of stuff. And the, um, although it's not terribly hard to follow the Administrative Procedures Act, it is important to be sure that people are following the procedures that are required. As I mentioned, if you appeal to the director uh, and the hearing officer is appointed, this hearing is de novo, another one of those law school terms, which means essentially all new. Um, proceedings at the Board of Civil Authority uh, are irrelevant. They may be interesting, but they are not relevant to the ultimate process of making the decision here. The, um, essentially, each party proves the whole case all over again, and we're going to talk about that in detail in a slide or two. And the statute specifies that a hearing officer may inspect the property, but if either party requests an inspection and the hearing officer must inspect the property. Taxpayer must allow the hearing officer to inspect the property. It is done with all the parties present and it is becomes a part of the fact finding process by the hearing officer. So uh, I am going to toss out a pre hearing issue because I'm absolutely fascinated by this case. Um, it is Williams versus the town of North Hero. And I don't know who Williams was. I got a guess, maybe a lawyer or an accountant. I don't know if the case actually mentioned that or not. But in any event, one of the elements of a case proceeding before uh, a hearing officer is discovery is allowed. Remember yesterday I mentioned that discovery can involve um, taking depositions. Discovery can involve submitting written questions. Discovery can involve requesting specific records. And in this case, Mr. Williams, in the course of his appeal, asked the town of uh, North Hero to produce an Excel spreadsheet with data that the town had in its possession. And the reason that I assume he had to have been a lawyer or a, an accountant is because he asked for the spreadsheet in native format with unprotected cells. Okay, if you're not a big Excel fan, that may not make a lot of sense, but, um, what he was asking for was the actual Excel spreadsheet with the live data in it and no locks on any of the cells because what he wanted to see was what data got fed into the formulas that resulted in his, in the determination of his value. 
And instead, the town of North Hero um, produced a of the spreadsheet. Technically, they produced a PDF, but that did not have the live data and it did not have the formulas. And so Mr. Williams pointed out their error. And the town said, uh-huh, and sent him the PDF again. And Mr. Williams pointed out their error. And the town basically, I believe, sort of said, you got what you got. And so Mr. Williams, knowing his rights, went to the hearing officer and said, they are not cooperating in their discovery obligations. I want this. I am entitled to this. And I want you to subpoena them. Well, the town's first response was, well, that spreadsheet doesn't exist. Okay. Um, the hearing officer holds a hearing. And at some point in the process, the town said, oops, that spreadsheet does exist and turned it over. And everybody was mad at them. And the hearing officer exercised what the hearing officer believed was their power and imposed a fine on the town. I believe the amount, yeah, the amount was $2,000 for their um, failure to respond to the timely respond to the discovery requests. Now that works in court, as you can imagine in most lawsuits where there is electronic evidence, so emails, um, documents, other information that exists in digital format, you're probably not going to have to worry about Facebook pages or Instagram feeds or any of that sort of stuff, Slack space, Slack messages, any of that. But um, you do have digital data in your possession. If someone asks you for it, depending on what they ask for, how they ask for it, you have a legal obligation to provide it. That means you need to know when someone says, I want this data in native format and unprotected, you need to know what that means. Because although the Supreme Court actually reversed the penalty, and they only reversed the penalty because the town ultimately actually provided the data that Mr. Williams wanted, the court did point out that in certain circumstances, the failure to comply with discovery requests can result in penalties. Now, I don't know if a hearing officer has the right to impose the ultimate penalty that a court can in a discovery dispute, but if you're in court, let's say your appeal took that tack and went to the a superior court instead of to a hearing officer, if you don't respond to discovery requests, which your lawyer is not going to let you do, but if you choose not to, or if you flat out refuse, it is ultimately within the court's power to find against you. Essentially, you lose the case because you wouldn't produce the information that was required. There is a lesser penalty, which is called an adverse uh, inference, in which the court will assume that the data you refuse to produce proves the other side's case, which is almost a result equal to you lose, unless there's a good legal argument why you shouldn't. So be aware of that. I think people are learning more about this discovery stuff. I think if you have lawyers involved in a, an appeal to the director, which is sometimes the case, although I think it's more uh, the parties, you and, and the taxpayer, and less about lawyers involved. There are cases that get appealed to the um, director that are high stakes, big number cases, and they can involve teams of lawyers. So just be aware. All right. So the statutory requirements are that the hearing officer proceed de novo, and this is the burden. Determine the correct valuation of the prop 
property as promptly as practicable and to determine a homestead and house site value if there's a declared homestead with respect to the property. Um, the hearing officer, the statute for some reason specifies that the hearing officer has to take into account laws on valuations, the Constitution and, and the US Constitution. The 14th Amendment being the equal protection and the due process uh, requirements. Um, it, uh, clearly, um, if the uh, value that the hearing officer determines is not um, comparable, then the uh, hearing officer has to adjust. The uh, hearing officer is required to produce written findings and um, essentially specify the reasons for the decision. This is where hearing officers run into trouble with the Supreme Court all the time. Most hearing officers are probably not lawyers. Uh, even if they are lawyers, they may or may not be particularly good about writing the judicial style of opinion. And there is a very specific style to the way judicial opinions are written. And so many hearing officers have gotten into trouble with the Supreme Court because they don't identify the facts that they found. They don't relate the facts to the law in the discussion and then come to a conclusion that they can point to. These were the facts I used. This is the law I used and this is the necessary uh, conclusion that follows from those facts and the law. And so you'll often see older Supreme Court opinions in which it who tries to get a decision because the first time the court remanded the decision to the hearing officer with the direction to write better findings, and then it might go up again um, while, so the court could um, explain what the law is, was, should have been. And sometimes the decision will be, you need to hear this again, but you missed on the law and this is the law you should apply. But the key factor in both of those is you didn't do a good job of finding the facts. And it's often not because the facts weren't there. It's often a function of the hearing officer not being able to identify the key facts that they need to assemble in order to have their conclusion make sense. Um, and we talked about inspections of the property. And so. Um, now we're going to switch topics uh, real quick. And we're going to talk about the internal decision process of an appeal. Um, and this actually works whether the appeal goes to Superior Court or goes to the go, goes to a hearing officer. At the first step, the town, you. Present your valuation. And if nothing else happens, that valuation should be upheld because the value that you produce at the beginning of the hearing, in the first phase of the hearing, has a presumption of validity. It's presumed to be right. But as soon as you present that value in the hearing officer to the court, then the, the, the burden, the so-called burden shifts over to the taxpayer. The taxpayer is then obligated to produce some evidence that your valuation was either improperly, illegally done, or doesn't represent the correct value of the property. They don't have to prove their case at that second stage, but they have to get enough evidence before the person is going to make the decision that is relevant and good evidence points to a different conclusion. Once they do that, then you, the town, has to be able to show 
that your that you complied with the relevant statutory and constitutional requirements or that your value is supported by independent evidence of fair market value. It's generally best to do both. You want to be able to show that you followed all the correct processes to get to a decision, but you also want to be able to show that the best evidence involving the three forms of valuation, whichever ones you chose to use, lead to a conclusion that your valuation was correct. It is ultimately the obligation of the taxpayer to convince the person who's hearing the case that you are wrong and they are right. But remember that step process. You get to put your value in and, and the hearing officer court assumes you're right. Once the taxpayer sticks a pin in your bubble and it bursts, then each of you is on your own to fully prove your case again. And that is where sometimes the town gets a little bit into trouble because they've made their first presentation of the evidence and maybe they don't go into as much detail as they should. They get enough in so that the, the, the decision maker has a basis to make a conclusion that they are they met the minimum test. But then as soon as the taxpayer starts on their evidence, pay careful attention to what's going on. It's almost always best to the extent the hearing officer or the judge will let you to make your full case up front. You're going to have a chance to argue that the taxpayer's evidence isn't right, just like they're going to have an opportunity to argue that your evidence isn't right. And there will be some back and forth, depending on how organized the hearing officer is. Um, the court will be very careful about the exact sequence. It's always up to the uh, person who filed the appeal to prove their case. Um, if, if the other party says you didn't prove your case and the judge agrees, then the party who filed the appeal loses. Um, then it typically will change from the party that filed the appeal to the party that's defending the appeal, and they get to put on their case, and there may be some back and forth after that. All right. So um, if I haven't said this once, and I almost always say stuff like this at least three times, it's important to get all your evidence in. You may have made a brilliant presentation at the Board of Civil Authority, and the Board of Civil Authority may have gone into significant detail in creating their reasons for how they came to the conclusion that the original change in the assessed value was correct. Well, none of that means anything. You have to make the same brilliant presentation and prove all the same elements. Again, if you're before a hearing officer or if you are in court. So don't slack, put on a good case. In my way of explaining it, tell a great story. All right. Part of the reason for this is you want to convince the, fat, the, the, the person who's going to make the decision that you're right. And, and not doing a good job is not being convincing. But equally important, if there is an indication that the issue is going to be appealed to the Supreme Court, Remember, the Supreme Court is not going to hear any new facts, and they are not going to hear any new arguments. We saw that in uh, Zlata. What you want to do is be sure that all your facts and all your reasons are laid out before the original decision maker so that if that goes up on appeal, you will be able to point to well, I told that hearing officer, well, we presented evidence on this, this, and this point to the hearing officer. They ignored it, but the evidence was there for them to see. And, excuse me, in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can then take into account that evidence because it's in the record. All right. Um, now, Let's say you go to uh, the, the appeal goes to Superior Court instead of to a hearing officer. Well, this is a much more formal process. 
in most cases that go on appeal to the, uh, to the superior court, you're going to want to be represented by an attorney. The attorney is going to take care of all the technical requirements. You don't really have to know the rules of civil procedure. You don't really have to know the rules of evidence. Although a good attorney who is helping you through a, an appeal to superior court is going to tell you about some of the key principles in evidence because they are going to want to be sure you don't do something like uh, in response to a question, say, well, so-and-so told me that, and everybody stands up and objects, because you can't say what you heard. It's called hearsay evidence, and you can't testify that somebody else told me something, except in some very rare circumstances. So your lawyer is going to coach you. You can talk about what you know, you can talk about what's in the records that are in your control, but you can't talk about the fact that the, that, that one of your select persons told you that so-and-so's farm really doesn't go all the way, uh, really does in fact go past that stream all the way to the old stone wall. And so it really is bigger than it is. And that's why the value is if you went and inspected it and you know that's the case, you can testify about that, but you can, almost never say X told me thus and have that be evidence in a case. All right, um, we did talk about this in Zolotov. Be sure you get all your arguments out there. The, the, they were very specific that the town had the, uh, um, completely had the opportunity to argue that either the garage didn't benefit the public or that there was more land there than the garage needed. And in either case, having not raised them, um, the court wouldn't consider those arguments. All right, so um, the Jackson Gore in case, uh, I'm actually gonna pass this one by because I'm hoping we have a couple of minutes to skip to that um, better, uh, uh, going through that case with a little bit more uh, detail. And then I already mentioned that um, the uh, hearing officer is obligated to do an in-depth analysis, find the facts. Um, you can't just say, well, this person showed up and testified that the house had five bedrooms and the finish fit and finish was really good. And uh, six more things. And, and based on that, I came up with a value of five hundred ninety five thousand um, dollars. It happens in this particular case. Um, there were competing appraisals and a whole bunch of other information. And um, I thought this was very nice of the court to say that that the hearing officer clearly explained each appraiser's calculations, where they agreed, where they disagreed, and why she was crediting one appraiser over the other. Hearing officers are entitled to listen to your evidence and not believe you. Um, they are equally entitled to listen to the taxpayer's evidence and not believe the taxpayer's evidence. So uh, you can't be offended if the hearing officer or the court says, yes, I heard this in this evidence, but I don't give it much weight. And they may say why, um, you know, uh, I'm not giving this particular appraiser's opinion on the adjustments made to these factors because the appraiser's report was inconsistent with their testimony, anything like that. So, it's always a function of what does the fact finder believe is the best evidence submitted in the case? All right, once, the, once there's an appeal, there's a decision. Um, if you don't like the director's decision, if you don't like the court's decision, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, but again, remember the appeal is only going to address um, 
legal issues, not facts. It is important if an appeal is going to the Supreme Court. I can't imagine a circumstance where the town agent is going to do the appeal uh, on behalf of the town, especially if the town agent happens not to be an attorney with experience in Supreme Court appeals. But in any event, it is really important to be sure that the notice of appeal is correct. I'm going to pop up the Jackson Gorin case in a minute. And we'll take a look at some of the things the court talked about in there. Um, so uh, what does the Supreme Court look at? Well, the court's going to affirm the decision as long as the hearing officer or the judge's opinion can be shown to be drawn from the evidence and also uses the right law. Um, then. Ultimately, just like I told you yesterday, the Supreme Court will render a decision. They may uphold the lower court's decision. They may reject the lower court's decision and reverse it and tell a lower court to do something different. Or they can remand, uh, which often happens when the facts are uh, hard for the Supreme Court to figure out. So let me. I wanted. Oh, I did not pull up Jackson Court. Hang on just a second while I do this. All right. So this is the Jackson Gore in case. This was a an interesting case. Most of you will never. Uh, have to deal with this particular issue, but if you happen to live in a resort town or a resort area, uh, this case may be coming for you at some point. Um, Jackson Gore uh, was um, a part of a condominium development, but in addition to being a condominium development, which has its own issues in the assessment process, Jackson Gore also happened to be a timeshare. Now, if you don't know what a timeshare is, they were big in the 80s. They started to sort of slow down in the 90s, and now everybody's just terrified of them. Um, a timeshare takes the ownership of a unit and breaks it up into time blocks. There are typically quarter share units where you would likely own the right to occupy a specific condominium unit for 12 weeks of the year. Um, they may come down as low as a week. You may only own a specific week in a unit. And every year you can occupy the unit during that week, but only during that week. Um, and valuation of timeshares can be very, very challenging as the people who are involved in this particular case found out. So this was a uh, an appeal for property valuation review. There was a hearing officer. Uh, I can tell you that there were a couple of real high powered attorneys involved in this particular case. I know both of them. And this was a this was an interesting but somewhat tough case. Um, the court started out with laying out the bubble. So uh, and and then also pointing out that you have to determine the value of the property. And because these were commercial property, well, they were sort of residential, but they're really commercial properties because you can't live in a timeshare like you can live in a residence. You can occupy it. But so the court responds, you know, there are various ways of determining value, market approach, income approach, um, replacement cost approach. And then you, um, once the value is determined, you have to determine if it represents a reasonably equivalent value across the class. And if not, you have to equalize. So the court almost always goes through a process of describing this. If you pick up any one of these cases, it will give you a pretty good history. But the ultimate issue in these cases were what happens in the condominium setting because you have your on the one hand you have your unit 
the cube of air in the walls that you that you can occupy. OK, that has value. But you also have a share shared interest in the hallways, the outside walls, the roof. Mm, probably in one of these vacation condo type things, you've got pools and tennis courts and recreational facilities and maybe restaurant, maybe meeting rooms, who knows, all kinds of stuff. And all of that adds some value too. Well, the dispute in Jackson Gore was fascinating because on the one hand, the pounds appraisal was the value of the unit, and we add a separate value for those common elements. And we add them together, and we get the value of the whole thing. But careful reading of the law suggests, yes, you have the unit, but a part of the unit is the value that the common elements represent overall. It's not a separate value that applies to the unit and a separate value, but the value of the unit should take into account the common elements. So if you have a little condominium that has no common elements other than stuff like the walls and the roof and the driveways and the parking lots, well, most of the value there is likely going to be in the unit. And the fact that you have access to the driveways, the parking lots, and there are walls to hold up your cube of air and a roof over your head so it doesn't rain in your cube of air, um, might not add a lot of value. But if you live in one of the upscale projects that's got multiple swimming pools and who knows, maybe a golf course and all kinds of stuff that adds significant value to the ownership of the cube of air, then you take all of that into account and you put together the value. So in this case, the thing that was most impressive was the process by which the hearing officer went through the testimony of the two expert witnesses. So there were two commercial appraisers. They used similar but slightly different methodologies for arriving at their valuation. They apparently explained them at length, which is good. And the hearing officer did a good job of listening to all the evidence, determining which of the two appraisal processes most closely approximated the law as the hearing officer understood it, took the elements of that appraisal, laid them out, and made the decision. And that was um, exactly how. The court wanted it done, and the court was very uh, complimentary of the hearing officer, unlike many of the cases where the uh, court says the hearing officer barely figured out how to do the findings of fact, and we guess we have enough facts to make a decision. There were a couple of issues otherwise in this court, which was uh, in this decision, which was the um, incomplete notice of appeal which the court said, yeah, the notice of appeal wasn't perfect, but enough of the information got into the notice of appeal, so we're going to not find that as a problem. Um, there was an issue about the timeliness of the notice of appeal that the town didn't file its uh, notice uh, allegedly on time as to, and, and I forgot to mention that there were actually two projects here. There, there was Jackson Gore and Adams House, and they were related but separate projects. And the court said, look, everybody knew everything was going up. We're not going to penalize the town in this particular case. Um, filing an incorrect or late notice of appeal, and in fact, get your appeal kicked because there is a rule that says the court does not have jurisdiction if the appeal is not properly taken. Um, but the courts will sometimes, for minor errors that don't seem to prejudice anyone, the court will say, eh, it's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna let it go. Um, and otherwise, 
the whole discussion in here about the findings and the process of the findings and the process itself is good. This is a long opinion. I don't actually know, 15 pages, that's a fair amount of reading to read. But if you have condominium units in your town and you have to assess them, and particularly if you are doing reassessments or changing the assessments on condominium units, at least reading the court's explanation for why you don't add a separate value for the um, common elements that are all a part of the condominium is a worthwhile use of some of your time. Now, the other thing that you want to pay attention to is in some condominium projects, there is the condominium and then there is a separate entity that owns property that is not a part of the condominium. And this is a very sophisticated analysis of how stuff happens under the Common Ownership Interest Act. And so if you've got one of those circumstances, this is something to go get help from someone who actually understands and can explain the process of how you determine if the common elements are a part of the condominium or owned by a separate entity. Um, typically, you're looking for a different owner, um, but that isn't always the case. And so, like I said, that can be a bit of a challenge. And uh, that's why I like this Jackson Gore in not only because um, the court does a good job of explaining why the findings were particularly good, how the how the hearing officer balances the interests of the two uh, professional uh, the two expert witnesses um, are all a really good um, discussion that's worthwhile caring about. All right. So uh, we have a couple more cases to talk about, and then you can have the rest of your afternoon to yourselves. Um, I, I foolishly left the title as recent case. It's now getting old enough, so it's probably not a recent case, but it's an interesting case. Uh, this is Gettys versus the town of Bolton. And from what little I know about the technical aspects of the appraisal process, I can explain the law of the, the assessment process, the appraisal process to you, but could I do your job? Not a chance. Um, what you do is a great skill set and not one that I have. But when I read this decision, I was mildly offended by what I'm about to tell you. So Bolton is in the process of doing a reappraisal. In the course of doing that, the person who was doing the reappraisal and setting the values manipulated the quality rate to adjust the price to an approximation of the recent sale price. Like I said, I am by no means an expert in what you do. That doesn't sound right to me. That sounds to me like we were looking for a way to get to a number and changing the factor that we knew would adjust across the entire assessment process would get to the number we wanted, but it doesn't sound legitimate to me. In fact, the court mentioned that an expert witness testified that the quality grade is fixed at construction and should not change from year to year. So what does the court do? Say that was wrong? We're, we're finding for the taxpayer. The court says, look, it's a two-step process. First, you find the fair market value, then you equalize it. And they did that. And, and they found a reasonable fair market value. And the equalization process worked. The court, and I'm kind of, hmm, probably changing the words a little bit, but still getting to the central idea here. That manipulating the quality grade wasn't an error. And the reason was because the ultimate equalization showed a reasonable approximation of the value relative to other properties. So 
bad process equals OK result equals OK. I wouldn't rely on that as being the law forever going forward. I think it worked in this case because probably the way the the facts worked out in the decision, the court said, yeah, it wasn't the best methodology, but it was it came to the right result. And ultimately what we want is the right result. Remember, sales chasing is not appropriate if the result comes out as an unequal assessment. So remember I said that the adjustment to the um, quality grade was meant to approximate the recent sale price. That could in theory have been sale chasing, but I guess because ultimately the end result showed a reasonably equal value through the equalization process, the court was okay. Um, so ultimately there, I blame the taxpayer's lawyer for not focusing in on the witness's testimony that said, you can't fix this by adjusting the quality grade. You, you can go through and, and adjust other things, but that was not an appropriate way to do it. And because they did it that way, because the method was wrong, the whole case should have been decided in favor of the taxpayer, even though the result was right. But that's not how the court operated. All right. Hansen versus Irisburg. Another interesting case. This is a circumstance where we are in the where, where we're trying to come to a valuation of an incomplete structure. So we go to Superior Court and the town's expert witnesses. So it, it wasn't, I don't know if it was the listers or if it, no, I, it was appraisers. So the town brought in appraisers, examined the property, used the Marshall and Swift cost tables, showed exactly how they took each of the elements and applied the Marshall and Swift um, factors, came up with a value, and determined the final value. And the taxpayer's objection to this whole thing was, we don't care who these Marshall and Swift guys are, if they are guys, in fact. Um, we have invoices. We can show you how much the two by fours cost us, and we can show you how much the how much the sheetrock cost and how much the tile cost. And we can show you what the plumber charged us to put in the pipes and the electrician to put in the elect the, the, the wiring. That's what should be reference the cost. And the court said no. No. In the process of assessing for tax purposes, a partially complete structure, the use of the Marshall and Swift tables was a perfectly reasonable way. The appraisers explained it in detail. The appraisers matched the actual conditions on the property to the Marshall and Swift tables. Everything was done correctly. You do not get to lowball the value by using the cost of your materials without taking into account whatever value is added simply by the construction or whatever value is added by your own labor. All right, uh, I did the Jackson Gore case. This is the, the paragraph that talks about the how common property may be related. Um, and that's it. Thanks for letting me join you and talk to you at length about topics that are of great interest to me. And as you'll notice at the very end of this, I did give you my email. Uh, I am happy to answer questions. I am not happy to give you legal advice. Um, but uh, if you want to send me an email and uh, if you're a little bit patient because I can't respond to every email immediately, uh, I am retired. Um, I will help you get on the right foot to start looking into the law underlying the question you have. So thanks so much, and I hope you have a good day and a great career in uh, assessing property for your town.